Good morning, everyone in Europe, and good afternoon to our friends in Asia. Uh, on behalf of the Asia Program and the Program for Global Politics and Security, both at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar, Climate Diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific. This title includes two words which very rarely come together, climate diplomacy on one hand and the Indo-Pacific on the other. What is climate diplomacy? Well, we can picture diplomats being part of negotiations regarding climate agreements. We might not as easily see climate as a domain in which states engage or compete with one another, build coalitions and narratives. The idea of climate as a political space of cooperation and contestation is perhaps especially important to discuss today when states make unilateral climate commitments, but also form part of bilateral, minilateral, and multilateral arrangements for handling the climate crisis. To get a better idea of what climate diplomacy is and what place it has in the toolbox of actors like India, Japan, and the EU, it is useful um, to discuss this as we head towards COP26. And what about that other term that I mentioned, Indo-Pacific? The Indo-Pacific is a geographical region covering seascapes and littorals from East Africa to the Western Americas. It's also a concept which can help us organize our thinking about a world where power shift eastwards to a rising Asia and especially China. It also helps us to think about ways in which international relations are being structured in a multipolar world where emerging economies are turning into global powers. Arguably, the Indo-Pacific be will become the most consequential region in the world in coming decades. It will be there global cooperation and rivalries are defined in politics and economics. It is home to a wide range of traditional and non-traditional security concerns, including climate-related risks. While Japan has actively been leading the conversation about the Indo-Pacific, the EU was a late adapter. But on the 16th of April this year, the EU um, adopted council conclusions regarding the Indo-Pacific. And a new communication is to be published after this summer. Climate will be central to the EU's engagement in the EU Indo-Pacific region. How, why, and through what means, we will hopefully learn more about today. And we have a great set of speakers lined up to, dis to discuss this. Um, and we are mixing perspectives from diplomats and researchers. And we will start with our two experts. Uh, Dr. Danashri Jayaram, uh, Assistant Professor at Manipal University, and Dr. Gunilla Reichel, Head of Program and Senior Research Fellow at the GBS, GPS Program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. After their first interventions, we will turn to the diplomats. We have the Director for the Climate Change Division, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Yunichiro Otaka, and we also have the EU ambassador at large for climate diplomacy, Mr. Mark van Hecklen. After their interventions in turn, we will revert back to the experts so they can pick up a few of the themes that were discussed by the diplomats. And then after that, we open up for a Q&A with you, the audience, and you can send your questions and comments, or rather actually your questions um, in the chat box. And you can start uh, as soon as you please, and we'll try to pick them up in the Q&A. Um, I should also say that this event is live streamed on Facebook, um, and uh, uh, an edited version will hopefully be available um, later on. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll give uh, the word to um, uh, Danashri Yayaram, to sort of discuss a bit about what do we mean when we talk about climate diplomacy. Danashri, please. 
Thank you so much, Hendrik and uh, Sophie and Axel for uh, having me on this program. Uh, so it is an opportune moment to talk about climate diplomacy because uh, we are going to see the big summit happening uh, later this year in Glasgow, which is going to decide the fate of the international climate order and regime, the post-2020 regime as we talk about it. Uh, so to start with, I think I should... I think I should mention this, that climate diplomacy is not new. It has existed for a long period of time, since the 1980s and early 90s, when climate change became or began to be recognized as an issue that impinges on global governance, as an issue which requires international cooperation, as, a, as an issue that affects so many people from around the world. So that with that kind of recognition i think climate diplomacy evolved at least as practice but of course like you mentioned as a conceptual framework it took much longer for countries to come up with strategies that put uh, that put climate diplomacy at the conceptual level conceptualize it in various means so one of the things that constantly comes up with the evolution of climate diplomacy itself is the nature of it right so as you mentioned a lot of it initially was just dealing with negotiations and how countries positioned themselves in the international climate order and why they uh, why they take a certain position and why don't they cooperate on certain issues. So climate diplomacy was kind of uh, preoccupied with these kind of discussions. But I think over a period of time, it has come to recognize unilateral uh, dealings, multilateral uh, achievements, bilateral arrangements on climate change. And as we see, climate diplomacy is something that recognizes the fact that climate change is at the center of foreign policy agenda of many countries, uh, including, for instance, uh, many countries of the European Union. Right now, you can see the United States also putting it at the forefront. Other countries have also put it at the center of their foreign policy agenda. So that's not exactly what uh, climate diplomacy means. Uh, and in other ways, also, there is also the recognition of the fact that climate change affects peace and security, for instance. Uh, so in what ways does it affect peace and security and what are the measures that can be adopted uh, to have more climate sensitivity in our peace and security policies as we talk about climate change is also central to climate diplomacy narratives uh, in today's world. Uh, however, like you mentioned, climate diplomacy is not perceived in the same way by different countries. So this is something uh, that, that we have to recognize as we talk about the geopolitical construct of the Indo-Pacific, or you talk about the European Union. So European Union, which has a much uh, uh, clearer strategy as far as climate diplomacy is concerned. However, you look at the Indo-Pacific region, uh, there is not much of that, uh, you know, uh, that mutually reinforcing interest that you will find among the countries of the region. Now, this is something that we have to realize that climate diplomacy is as much about interest as much as it is about values and norms. So, uh, so as as far as you see, the where the Indo-Pacific is positioned on climate diplomacy initiatives. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you look at, for instance, I'll take the simple example of climate security, for instance. Now, most of the countries within the Indo-Pacific do not really recognize the security implications of climate change because there are so many different priorities as far as climate change or other issues like today's uh, world is, of course, concerned about how to deal with pandemic, how to deal with economic development concerns and other issues are concerned. So in that way, uh, there are, of course, differing interests. The European Union might be more interested in pushing the third parties also into climate action, for instance. However, you look at how the Indo-Pacific countries look at it, which again, uh, constitutes different types of countries. You have developing countries, least developed countries, as well as a few developed, uh, uh, developed countries as well. So that way to find that mutually uh, reinforcing interest becomes much more difficult as it is. And of course, you have China in the middle of all of this. And for China, the, this geopolitical construct means different things. It may not be very China friendly in the first place. So therefore, you look at Quad, for instance, which has come up with its own climate change working group. It's fine. But then this climate change working group, does it involve all the countries? Uh, does it actually uh, you know, uh, recognize the interests of all the, all the countries in the Indo-Pacific? Or is it more like the great power interests that are being served? Or is it an issue on which they can at least come out and say, this is an issue on which we are cooperating, which can lead to greater cooperation on, on other issues? So these are some of the questions that we have to answer uh, as we talk about uh, 
uh, climate diplomacy and uh, differing interests between different nation states or uh, regional organizations uh, or a set of states which have uh, set, uh, I mean, set across their policies on climate change. Thank you so much. Um, uh, excellent introduction. I, I think we go straight uh, to Gunilla to, to discuss the, the, the sort of global dimension of this. Uh, Gunilla, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Henrik. And uh, I'm very happy to participate in this topical seminar today. Uh, what I would like to do in my sort of five minutes, <laughs> I would like to discuss four factors that are relevant for the upcoming climate talks uh, on a global level, but also it somehow could contextualize the discussion on the region. Uh, and it will uh, tie into what uh, the previous speaker just discussed as well. So the four factors or themes, it's the pandemic, the change in the US leadership and the recent groundswell of net zero targets and also the climate efforts outside the climate negotiations. So if you look at uh, the pandemic, the main effect of the pandemic on climate change, we don't know that for sure yet, obviously, but it will probably be its influence on the national commitments to action if states will be able to stick to the pledges and if recovery package will include climate measures as they are promising. So this will become a, a very important uh, issue in the upcoming years, not only for the climate talks. But when it comes to uh, the climate negotiations and the COP26 meeting, uh, the last, last May, this meeting was postponed due to the pandemic and instead it will take place in Glasgow in November this year. And uh, just to sort of underline the importance of this meeting is that it will, it is seen as one of the last chances to, to put the world on track to fulfill the 2015 Paris Agreement's objectives to, to tackle the climate emergency. Um, and uh, raising ambition is central here. Uh, there will be a number of issues that are difficult, obviously, as always in climate diplomacy, uh, but there are also some issues that left outstanding from the last meeting held in Madrid in 2019, for example, the international carbon markets, that will be uh, an important topic. Um, so also last year, there was some discussions on whether or not you could hold formal negotiations online, but for developing countries, they, it's not uh, it's not a possibility and they were very reluctant to hold major, major negotiations online for reasons such as poor internet access. Uh, but this year, uh, due to the pandemic, governments will hold a three week online meeting from late May to mid June and where they will begin to hammer out agreements and key aspects of the talk. Um, so when it comes to the US, uh, which is uh, a very important actor in climate diplomacy, but uh, the US has begun to sort of rebuild its climate credibility. Uh, President Biden, for example, rejoined the Paris Agreement on his first day in office. And in April, the US convened a climate leadership meeting with uh, 40 countries participating. Um, and uh, at this meeting, it's relevant for the discussion of this region the US and India announced a new climate partnership to focus on, on the driving urgent progress on, on climate. Uh, so this is obviously a very, very big change from uh, previous US uh, leadership uh, or the previous president. And uh, it will be important for the US because it could set a moral, a moral example for other actors. But uh, we will have to, to see if the US is able to, to follow up on its own pledges. Uh, the third factor is uh, the recent and rather dramatic global shift uh, that we have seen. Over two thirds of the global economy is now under a mid-century net zero targets. And um, this is a response to climate science showing that in order to halt climate change, carbon emissions have to stop. Uh, reducing them is not sufficient. Net zero very briefly means that emissions are balanced by absorbing an equal amount from the atmosphere. Uh, there is some controversies when it comes to net zero targets. They have come under growing scrutiny. 
And the critique is that some of these commitments uh, made 30 years into the future do not include transformative actions to cut emissions in the short term. This has been a, a critique from India, for example. Um, and the developing countries argue that they need to develop uh, and are critical towards call for them to come to net zero while they are still developing, <laughs> while they're still developed world that occupied almost 80% of the carbon space. Uh, in turn, the US and the EU has argued that there is a huge potential for developing nations such as India to leapfrog polluting technologies and to meet energy needs uh, without increasing their carbon emissions. Uh, I think this is an interesting debate because it's sort of, it's bound to continue and it's, uh, uh, it plays into one of the most long-standing conflict lines in climate diplomacy, and that is responsibility and, and justice. So we will see more of that. Uh, lastly, what we could look for outside negotiations. Um, in recent years, we have seen an increase in, in different coalitions and alliances, bringing together ambitious and pioneering countries and cities aiming to achieve an accelerated transformation. Uh, for example, Carbon Neutrality Coalition, High Ambition Coalition, Powering Past Coal Alliance. Uh, the rationale for these collision is that it's promising to start off with a small group of enthusiastic actors uh, that set uh, a more ambitious target and then eventually implement measures against countries that are unwilling to join this coalition. Uh, that last part is more in theory, uh, it's not really existing in reality uh, just now. Um, but I would like to conclude with when it comes to this climate clubs or coalitions that they are meant to strengthen rather replace the UNFCCC uh, regime but it raises some questions about the linkages between these kind of minilateral and multi multilateral climate policy and uh, also uh, some legitimacy concerns of how this sort of how they fit into the con context of the UNFCCC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunilla. I, I would like to pick up on, um, pass one ball over to um, Donashri here, one thing that you mentioned, the sort of um, the impact of the pandemic uh, for the region. If we look at some countries in the region, they have been heavily affected and uh, and we see that, that that will, you know, both economic recovery and of course, in many other ways, the pandemic will have a huge impact. So um, how would you reflect on that? Uh, um, Dhanashri, from the regional perspective? Uh, it's difficult to again say because the, the effects of the pandemic have been varied across the Indo-Pacific region as well. So some countries have been less affected while others like especially the South Asian countries, particular India has been affected in a severe way. Uh, so uh, it's going to have a huge impact on the climate strategy as well for sure. Uh, because uh, as uh, uh, as Gunilla also mentioned, uh, one of the debates, the ongoing debates on climate action is the net zero emission strategy. Now with this kind of crisis that most of these countries are in right now, especially a country like India, which has already been reluctant to adopt such a strategy, how are the resources going to be uh, spent on various emergencies like that? This is a question mark uh, that we, I mean, this is a question that we have to think of as we move ahead. Of course, the post-pandemic recovery, if it is green uh, and if it is going to be more sustainable, there's al already been a lot of talk about sustainable investments and all of that, uh, even during the Ind uh, India-EU uh, summit that happened recently. These are, the, these, are the, uh, these are the discussions that has already happened, but on the ground, it's going to be even more difficult to implement a whole lot of policies without substantial investments uh, and financial assistance and technological assistance that can come, especially financial assistance, I guess, especially uh, on that front from the uh, from the developed countries. Now, this is going to be crucial for many countries in the Indo-Pacific to achieve their goals in the long run, if at all they commit to, uh, you know, much more ambitious climate goals. Uh, so in many countries, of course, uh, the because the economies are rather shattered and uh, it's going to take a long time to even uh, even come out of that crisis. Uh, you know, the emergency that that emergency frame that you use for climate change has shifted from uh, has shifted to the pandemic, right? So for the EU, for instance, climate emergency may still 
cold water it may something that that may actually uh, that may actually raise ambition on climate change but you don't find such emergency movements or climate emergency uh, in invocation happening in most of the countries uh, in this part of the world because like i mentioned pandemic is the emergency that they have to deal with on a on a much urgent basis and it depends on how countries emerge out of this crisis that you know climate change can become a priority area so right now i don't see climate change among the top most priority issues for a majority of countries in this region uh and i and i think this this mood will change only if there is going to be international cooperation and enough investments that can uh, that can come in from the developed countries in particular thank you so much um one more thing gunila before we segue over to uh mr otaka the the question that you raised towards the end uh, of your introduction here uh, with regards to the international environment here, the institutions, the partnerships, uh, the minilaterals, we know, of course, that Japan is part of the Quad, which has a, um, a climate um, working group, for example. Um, you raised some you know, uh, flags about uh, the, the new environment. Um, so what are the sort of positive outcomes of these more you know, um, uh, alternative ways of discussing uh, the climate issue and what are the, the, the problems that you see from, from this more um, um, web, this web of different uh, ways of uh, discussing and building relations around the climate crisis? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, issue. Um, I think the Paris Agreement is, could be seen as it opened up a totally new chapter in the political efforts to tackle climate change. And um, in with doing that, it sort of opened up for other actors, non-state actors, to, for cities, for business uh, to participate uh, in climate efforts. And that is absolutely crucial for success uh, in this. So I think um, in this sort of new environment, uh, instead of only being focused on, on intergovernmental uh, negotiations, we need to sort of understand this broader landscape of different actors that participate and what they could contribute with. And these coalitions, when they combine actors, both like cities and, and, and nations and also business, uh, they, the credibility of talking about ambition becomes it becomes very trustworthy uh, when you have this sort of broad broad commitments from the whole of society uh, so that's that's one very important thing for uh, in this sort of new landscape i mean when we talk about the new landscape the shift has been ongoing for quite a while and i think the paris agreement sort of was the manifestation of this shift uh, it sort of turned everything upside and down um, I think also it could be worth mentioning here, we might come to that later, but it's uh, sort of how we understand climate change. Uh, it, before it was more understood as one issue, like one problem that could be solved by one institution, uh, by states, but now it's more seen like a broad process that includes security, trade, uh, a lot of different issues uh, that need, so we need so many actors to participate in this. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, we will now turn uh, uh, over to uh, Mr. Otaka and to get um, Japan's view on the international uh, collaboration around uh, the climate um, uh, crisis and climate action, and uh, especially with reference, of course, to the Indo-Pacific region. Yes, thank you very much, Hendrickson, and uh, thank you, uh, Sophie Axel and other organizers. Uh, and also other participants for giving me the opportunities to participate in this meeting. Um, I think the, uh, the meeting is particularly meaningful uh, uh, because we can uh, come up with um, all of this uh, important agenda on the climate change, uh, particularly from the, um, as mentioned at the outset, from the context of the uh, international relations uh, focusing on the Indo-Pacific which I think is very important for all of the participants it's in this uh, webinar um, to um, pay attention to. Um, now, I think is the um, 2021 is the year uh, focused on the road to Glasgow. 
um, with the uh, five years um, after the adoption of the uh, Paris Agreement, with a particularly um, a particular focus on the climate change issue. And I think uh, one of the reasons why the um, climate change issue is uh, being focused is um, because of the US return to the Paris Agreement um, after the um, inauguration of President Biden. I think this is very meaningful because now the US as the major actor in the Indo-Pacific is now back on the stage on the climate agenda and trying to take over the leadership in the international uh, community in this issue. One of the um, examples of such move is the hosting of climate summit by uh, the uh, US in which about uh, uh, 40 uh, uh, heads of nation has participated and uh, committed themselves on the uh, climate actions. So uh, despite the difference of positions in uh, respective countries, I think it is meaningful that um, at the summit level, many leaders have committed themselves for climate action. Uh, in order to, um, as uh, mentioned by um, uh, Ganira-san, um, it is very important that uh, the developing countries take action, not only developing, developed countries, but developing countries in the Indo-Pacific region in order to uh, achieve a decarbonized society in the region and uh, globally. So uh, Japan on its part, is um, uh, taking action in order to promote such a move, including the assistance to developing countries. Uh, for Japan, uh, we have uh, done an annual 1.3 trillion yen assistance on the climate uh, change area, uh, both public and private. Uh, which amounts to about 11.8 uh, billion dollars and also uh, committed uh, three billion dollars to the green climate fund so um, it's important that we promote um, the decarbonization of the world itself and also the adaptation assistance which um, responds to the um, uh, effect negative effect that vulnerable nations are facing. So it is important to take actions on the, both two of these issues. And Japan has been uh, taking part in such efforts and will continue to do so. And with regard to the US, um, Japan also touched, um, launched a partnership with them in order to um, take action on three pillars. First is regarding the climate ambition and implementation of the Paris Agreement. And secondly, um, promotion of uh, innovation in the clean energy sector. And thirdly, assistance to the third country in the Indo, um, particular focus on the Indo-Pacific towards the decarbonization and transition. So um, also um, part, another part of such effort is a quad um, a working group. Um, and uh, it is um, true that the four countries themselves do have difference in these positions. And of course, this is um, uh, yet to um, be a global effort. I think one reason, uh, one uh, meaningfulness in having such a working group at uh, four country level is that uh, we can set an example or share um, a practice to be shared among others to uh, take an action uh, with other countries as well. Because if we um, uh, look at the experience that we have in the UN negotiations, it is very difficult to come to a, a common point of view because um, there are differences between uh, developing countries, uh, developed countries. We have uh, different groups of states amongst the regions. It is very different, uh, difficult 
to come to a concrete view or come to a, um, a proposed direction on taking actions. So um, I think um, the meaningfulness of code is that we can um, talk amongst the four nations, which um, each has a considerable um, uh, a presence in the region to hopefully come up with a um, positive example that we can share uh, for further action by uh, other partners in the region. Um, I think uh, one another important issue that we need to uh, touch upon uh, is China. I think uh, it will be um, discussed maybe later in the program, but um, China um, is now an emitter of one third of the um, CO2. Um, it has a, a, a global goal of net zero in 2060, uh, which is only a commitment of uh, CO2, not other greenhouse gases. But uh, having said that, I think it's very important as the largest emitter and also second largest uh, economic power and very important um, presence in the region for them to uh, act uh, on their initiative to fulfill their responsibility in the climate action itself. So um, I think uh, um, uh, all countries in the region and beyond can cooperate uh, in order to uh, bring about the positive outcome in um, how the different actors, including US, including China, including India, including other partners in the region, of course, including Japan, to um, how to move forward on this issue. Because after all, climate change is an agenda which affects everyone. Um, uh, I wanted to also touch upon the uh, pandemic issue, but maybe I can uh, do so at the later stage. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, can I just quickly just follow up with a couple of questions to you before I hand over to uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Van Heuklen? Um, so, so you mentioned um, your development assistance, and um, uh, and I, I, I assume it's it's uh, what you specifically reference to is um, towards the, the the sort of developing countries in the region, and especially perhaps partners within the ASEAN bloc. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? How develop the, the sort of uh, climate aspect has been attached to development assistance, um, and how that has changed over the for, over the last years? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's uh, um, the developing assistance uh, in the climate change area has uh, um, been a very important element in uh, Japan's uh, assistance. So um, I should uh, um, add particular focus on the adaptation assistance, because as I mentioned earlier, um, how to respond to the effect of climate change, particularly for vulnerable countries, is a very important question. And um, one of the important issue I should touch upon is about the disaster uh, relief, because Japan uh, itself is a very um, disaster prone country, it has constantly suffered from effects of um, uh, uh, extreme uh, weather, including typhoons and heavy rains, torrential rains and floods and so forth. So um, Japan has uh, substantial uh, knowledge and experience in this area. So uh, we have attached importance in how we can share the experience and also providing provide assistance to others which are prone to such uh, disasters as well. So uh, we have um, combined um, infrastructure building as well as capacity building um, in order to uh, provide assistance. Also, we have um, placed importance in the accessibility of um, uh, the um, vulnerable nations to the climate fund and uh, taken actions uh, in this regard, including uh, its commitment to the um, uh, green um, climate fund. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Ambassador Van Hicklen, um, 
I leave uh, the floor to you uh, to discuss uh, the EU's view on climate diplomacy and what you have um, specifically discussed with reference to the Indo-Pacific region. So please. Very good and uh, good morning or good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank, thank you for having me uh, in this seminar. Um, to pick up on what uh, Henrik just said, let me say a few words on how we see EU climate diplomacy uh, in 2021. Uh, and then um, say a few words also on how we see the, uh, the, 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 the landscape of climate uh, policy and action in the Indo-Pacific. Um, what is EU climate diplomacy in 2021? What, is, what are its main purposes? Uh, Danasri has already mentioned uh, in, say, generic terms, what are the main ingredients of climate diplomacy. The first, of course, is to convince other countries uh, to step up their ambition uh, with regard to both goals and climate action be it towards 2030 or towards climate neutrality. The European Union is responsible for 8% of emissions and that share is declining. So if we want to save the planet, we're not going to do it on our own. Um, clearly, we have to convince others uh, that uh, this is a really uh, existential question that we, not, well, that we have to tackle in earnest quickly or otherwise it is too late. Second uh, task of climate diplomacy is to explain to third countries and if need be to defend what we are going to do inside the European Union in order to get to our targets. Um, we uh, are now going to try and achieve a cut of minus 55% in 2030 compared to 1990. That's no small bear. Uh, what we have done from 1990 to 2020, over 30 years, we're now going to repeat in 10 years. That is a huge challenge, definitely in the knowledge that the lowest hanging fruits have already been picked. Clearly, there has been technological progress, but nevertheless, we, on the 14th of July, we're going to come out with 13 legislative proposals to uh, make sure that we get to those minus 55%. Some of those measures will have impacts on third countries. The third thing we need to do is, of course, as was also mentioned, to complete the Paris rule book. Uh, we, uh, I think, completed something like 90% of that rule book at COP24, or COP24 in Poland. In Madrid, we failed. We now have to have another go uh, in Glasgow. Uh, notably with regard to, uh, as was mentioned as well, um, carbon markets, transparency, and a number of other issues that were left outstanding. So those are the main tasks of the climate diplomats of uh, the European Union. The Indo-Pacific is going to be absolutely crucial for the failure or success of the Paris Agreement. And the reason is in a way simple. The Indo-Pacific holds 60% of the world population, 60% of world GDP, and is by far the most dynamic economic region in the world. Two thirds of economic growth in the foreseeable future will happen in the Indo-Pacific. So the big challenge, to put it in general terms, is how to decouple economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions. That is possible. We understand very well that the countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, prioritize growth and jobs, but growth and jobs need not be incompatible with climate neutrality. To give you one example, the European Union from 1990 to 2020 grew by 60% in economic terms, but we cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 22%. So it is not... Uh, safe, unavoidable, inevitable, that growth means more pollution. Now, what is the current situation with regard to climate action and ambition in the, in the Indo-Pacific? I would say that the picture is, to put it diplomatically, 
mixed. There are some countries like Japan that have clearly upgraded their targets. They did so in the context of the, uh, of the Biden summit. Japan has raised its target uh, to 46% compared to 2013. Hopefully, as uh, Prime Minister Suga pointed to, that may even go to 50%. Um, we also believe that a country like South Korea will also deliver on um, an enhanced target. We hope that the P4G summit at the end of this month will be the, uh, the occasion to do so. There are a number of countries in the Indo-Pacific that, frankly speaking, could and should do more uh, in terms of their climate neutrality targets, but actually, much more importantly, their target for 2030. The world, if you take all the announcements that were made <clears throat> since September of last year, when China came up with a number of new announcements, and then what we did and what was announced at the summit uh, of President Biden, is that 55% of world GDP is now in line with Paris. That also implies that 45% of world GDP is not yet in line with uh, the Paris Agreement, and we have to try and persuade others to step up to the plate and do more. I think with the, in the Indo-Pacific region, the big issue will be the exit from coal. How can you move away from coal, get into renewables, be it solar and wind, or be it green hydrogen? Those are the big questions in front of us, We've got to see together how the Indo-Pacific region can accelerate its exit from coal. For that, we have, of course, dialogues, but there, is also, there, are other, there are also other things. Climate finance is important. It has been mentioned, the 100 billion. But more importantly, mobilizing private capital markets. Governments can mobilize billions. But what is needed are hundreds of billions or trillions. That can only work through the private sector. So we've got to make sure that we siphon more money into sustainable investment, that our multilateral development banks and our national development banks focus more on climate-related issues, and that we work together in order to get to the technological breakthroughs we need. It is often said that if we really want to get to climate neutrality by mid-century, half of the solutions that we need to find have not yet been found or are not yet at scale. So these are the big things that ha we have to work on. This is the most global problem you can imagine. We are all, we're, we're in this all together and we have to cooperate. Um, it's clear, and both China, the US, and the EU have said this, obviously we will, have different, we will have our differences in many areas of policy, but we've got only one planet. We cannot afford not to cooperate. Back to you, Henrik. Thank you so much. Um, just to uh, follow up with a question before I uh, hand over to uh, Danashri and, and Gunilla as well to, to sort of reflect on what uh, has been said so far. Um, that is um, uh, one issue is, you know, green technologies and technology transfer to countries in the region. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about that issue uh, because you raise it yourself that, you know, we, we need to invest more in, in, in green technologies. So that's one question and, and sort of the EU view on this. And then the other question would be, how to to um, 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 to get to that uh, uh, you know private capital that that you mentioned? Um, uh, if there are ways you can elaborate a little bit on that, uh, what the EU is doing at this moment for 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 tapping into that potential, right? So green technologies and and capital. I mean, on green technology, I think there is already quite a lot of technological cooperation going on. I mean, we we just had the. Uh, EU-India summit, and there again, uh, there was a lot of uh, work done uh, in the run-up to the summit, but now also building platforms to roll this out further. 
of technological cooperation, be it energy efficiency, be it uh, the circular economy, be it uh, the rollout of renewables, or be it the new technological frontier, such as batteries and green hydrogen. Uh, we're also, uh, I mean, India is in there, Japan is in there, the EU is in there, in mission innovation. Um, a number of projects where indeed the world is cooperating um, in order to get to this, say, new frontier of uh, technological breakthroughs. With regard to capital markets, uh, the European Union is doing, I think, two or three things that are worth mentioning here. The first is um, to make sure that um, when we talk about green financial products, that they are actually green. Making sure that there are enough rules to avoid greenwashing. Um, so we have built a taxonomy, a detailed set of regulations to determine whether an investment project is green, is Paris aligned or not. Secondly, uh, we are working, and not only us, also Japan is doing that, uh, the, the US, other countries, on making sure that private companies disclose their exposure to climate risk, be it physical risk or be it the risk of transition. In other words, that they are building all sorts of plants that in the end become stranded ass assets because they are no longer going to be viable economically in a couple of years, when the, move, when the world moves towards much more stringent norms with regard to emission. Um, on the question of bringing capital to developing countries, I think there are two strands we need to work on. One is indeed to make sure that our multilateral development banks pay much more attention uh, to climate, be it to green their portfolio, to make sure that their non-green portfolio does not do any climate harm and to make sure that they use their expertise with recipient countries to ensure that there are enough bankable projects. Often when we talk to bankers, they say, we'd love to invest, but there are far too few projects to invest in. We need to make sure that there is bankability. Uh, finally, in countries like India, but also in others, uh, to get to more investment in climate uh, friendly sectors and in green energy, <clears throat> you need on the one hand, a regulatory reform in those countries that makes it much more interesting for foreign investors to invest in their countries. And on the other hand, you need to de-risk capital. Make sure that with some public money, you attract, you have a lever on private money. The private sector is interested, but still finds it too risky. We have to address, we have to address the components of risk such that it becomes interesting indeed for foreign firms and foreign banks to move into developing countries and um, invest in the low energy transition or low carbon transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'll now go back uh, to, the, to Danashri to see if you have any reflections on the two last interventions and then the same with, for Gunilla. And then I'll pick up a couple of questions that have come in uh, from, from the audience. So um, Danashri, please. Thank you so much. There are a lot of great points that were made by all the speakers. And I think uh, I'll just build on a couple of things here. Um, and I think one of the aspects in which there is scope for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, and I think there's a huge opportunity with the whole, uh, in, in respect to resilience of supply chains, for instance. Now we are talking about resilience of supply chains, maybe for a completely different reason, especially in terms of diversification and not depending too much on China for that matter. However, I think it's also important to think of how do you make these supply chains more sustainable and climate friendly for instance. And I think this is an opportunity that is presented in front of us. Um, and this also in fact applies to the critical mineral value chains for instance. You know, so 
again, that is something that is dominated by China as of now. So as we are talking about diversification, and I think this is an area where countries should cooperate with each other uh, because these minerals are, after all, key to the energy transitions and transitions in various sectors that we are talking about. So this is definitely one area that all the countries in, and, uh, in fact, the European Union should also be targeting as far as cooperation uh, is concerned. Uh, some of the other aspects uh, which I think uh, will also help us understand, uh, you know, how things are evolving. Like take the instance of International Solar Alliance, uh, which was uh, jointly launched by India and France. And it has now, uh, you know, it is open for universal membership now. Anybody can join. So many countries have joined now, including from Europe. Uh, but you look at how, you know, uh, the kind of cooperation between the International Solar Alliance and countries within the Indo-Pacific region itself. Now, many Southeast Asian countries, for instance, uh, are reluctant to join the ISA. Only Myanmar has so far uh, joined it and uh, ratified it. Others are reluctant because India refused to join the RCEP, the regional, uh, uh, you know, the RCEP, uh, uh, the treaty, right? So in that sense, with these kind of geopolitical fault lines which exist, climate cooperation is being held hostage to all these geopolitical concerns, uh, which I think will come in the way of effective cooperation. Another aspect I think uh, which was touched upon by some of the previous speakers also is about exit to coal, right? Ex uh, the exit from coal. Uh, and how do you really, uh, how do you really make sure that some of these countries are going to phase out coal? I mean. Uh, talking about uh, several countries, including India, Southeast Asian countries, South Asian countries, where investments in coal haven't stopped. And in fact, there are a lot of investments coming from China, for instance, in Southeast Asian countries through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and that's the same case in South Asian countries as well. So how do you make sure that coal is phased out, considering that, uh, considering that investments are still coming in through different channels? Uh, and these countries are, are, are not in a position to phase it out entirely uh, as of now because of the energy security concerns, which are, uh, which are uh, primarily uh, guided by a lot of other interests as well. Uh, so I think uh, exit from coal is something that we need to discuss in a much greater way. Uh, and I completely agree with the previous speakers that uh, this again requires international cooperation because most countries in the developed world had that time, you know, that time to exactly, you know, transition into much cleaner forms of economies. Whereas the developing countries are still in that phase where they they are still in that trap, wherein uh, it's difficult to imagine a transition so swiftly unless a lot of push comes from various other, uh, uh, I mean, assistance or any other form of. Uh, help that can come from different quarters. So I think these points may be adding to the existing uh, existing discourses itself, but happy to also talk about other issues which are important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, before uh, Gunilla, uh, I'll just uh, uh, ask you, Mark, if I may, uh, that question with exit cold uh, that you met, raised and that Danashri has now elaborated a bit on. Uh, are, do you have any specific reflections um, uh, on this, uh, given given Danashri's points here? Um, I have a few. I mean, the first is, I mean, clearly, countries should stop financing coal-fired power plants in uh, third countries. There are still three or three Asian countries that do so actively. Uh, South Korea, during the Biden summit, has said that they will stop. Uh, it would be good if other countries that are still uh, engaging in this practice uh, would uh, indeed put paid to that um, practice. Secondly, um, the good news is that the new types of um, energy, be it wind, solar, and probably in the future, uh, green hydrogen, are cheaper, are cheaper than electricity from coal. Clearly, what we need to do is uh, to make sure that the regions that are currently heavily dependent on coal mining, that they are given a perspective of um, structural adjustment. That regionally and socially, the people who are now heavily dependent on coal, be it miners 
or be it uh, companies or be it transport infrastructures, that they are given the perspective of a future because otherwise politically they will try to hold up the process of the exit from coal. But coal is so dirty and coal is um, gradually becoming so uh, uncompetitive that we really have got to do it. Um, it. It's going to be difficult because there are hundreds of thousands of people uh, having a livelihood from coal, but um, many parts of the world have shown that indeed you can uh, exit from coal and have an energy security uh, that will allow you to um, lubricate economic growth in the future. Thank you. Uh, we have we we have another question about coal uh, uh, from the audience, so we will return to that topic. But first, I I, uh, I give the floor to Gunilla with for some reflections on the intervention so far. Thanks. Uh, thanks for our very interesting talks, and uh, Dashri has already raised some excellent points. I think. Um, I think the thread that sort of runs through is how to raise ambition and what kind of cooperation is, is needed. Um, if we look at uh, look back and look at the idea behind the Paris Agreement, it was to let countries make pledges and then use that information for periodic checkups into what was working and what was not working and then raise climate ambition over time. And uh, uh, if we look at what the states are put into the climate pledges, this will reveal quite a lot of how they think about the problem and what the, how they do their prioritizing uh, in, in this area. Uh, how do they evaluate climate risks and how do they see policy opportunities, which have been mentioned here with sort of renewable energies, for example. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Otaka mentioned that Japan, for example, put forward climate adaptation and disaster relief as uh, prioritized uh, areas. Uh, and uh, other states, as I said, put premium on renewable energy uh, or, and on negative emissions or both or all of them. Uh, but I think this sort of raised the questions on of when governments articulate how they view the climate problem. Do they pay attention to, for example, how the issue of fossil fuel use and the need to shrink it? Or do they sort of step into uh, just speaking about new technologies uh, and uh, new policy opportunities? Um, I think this discussion on exit from coal uh, is showing that they, there is obviously an important discussion here and also the importance uh, of decoupling economic growth from emission, which has been a, a very important topic for quite a long time, but perhaps we'll become more and more um, uh, sort of uh, mentioned in, in, and discussed in, in policy circles. Um, I think it sort of, it also raises these questions of will states sort of end support for oil pipelines and will they stop dis issuing new drilling licenses? And will they push for tighter production curves through OPEC, for instance? I think these kind of actions, I mean, obviously the, the state's climate pledges speak, uh, have, contain messages, important messages, but the, the actual actions would speak very loud here on what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on your final point here, uh, do you see any uh, sort of, what are the signs for the, those more radical um, uh, um, you know, uh, to work in that sort of more radical way that you now describe, uh, what are the signs that you see that that is actually happening? I think, I mean, there are signs that this is happening and it's, it's a real, uh, there are some real actions here already, but uh, it's also that when we talk about, from my perspective, when we have this global perspective, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on on the same time or stimulation. So we always have to sort of keep <laughs> a lot of thoughts in our head in the same time. It's it's quite complex, but but there are obviously some trends uh, in uh, finance sectors and other sectors that are 
uh, working very hard for our decarbonizations, but also we see that big parts of the economy are still stuck in these old patterns and it's quite difficult to actually achieve uh, success here. So, um, so it's a mixed, mixed <laughs> message, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we, we just now lo lost uh, um, Junichiro, uh, so I don't know if he's still here. Yes, okay, good. Uh, so I have a question for you, uh, and it connects to coal. Uh, it's a question from the audience. So um, um, there ha have been reports about uh, new uh, coal power plants being uh, um, built in Japan. And so the question is, um, are these plans suspended um, uh, given the, the latest climate commitments by Japan? Or how is that, uh, you know, the new uh, coal plants, uh, the existence of those squared with these new commitments that, that Japan is making? That's the question from the audience. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I understand the coal um, uh, power, power plants. That's um, both uh, uh, domestic ones as well as the assistance overseas as uh, being a topic of discussion. And uh, as for Japan, um, we have uh, continued our policy um, for uh, abolishing um, the uh, inefficient uh, coal-fired power plants. And uh, we have um, uh, stated on the number of occasions, particularly on the uh, export policy, that we um, limit our case uh, on the uh, very um, limited occasion uh, where um, the uh, particular country um, is um, requesting um, as a necessary terms in order to um, promote the decarbonization of their own country. But um, so far, um, uh, we have um, made this as an exceptional case. And uh, uh, as a basic policy, um, we have um, stated that we will not the, uh, export the uh, coal-fired power plants, unless um, it corresponds to such a case. And as for the um, uh, the um, change of the energy source to renewable energy, we are totally in support, and uh, that's why uh, we have been uh, uh, promoting so much of uh, um, introduction of uh, renewable energy. We are now um, having a, a governmental and interagency, as well as um, those uh, related uh, uh, sectors on how we can um, achieve the uh, climate goal that has recently been set out by the prime minister. And um, such, of course, involves uh, substantial increase in the ratio of the uh, renewable energy. At the same time, I think we all need to look at uh, what, where we are currently uh, standing, what we are actually doing. Rather, of course, um, looking at the um, uh, um, mid-term goal, long-term goal is important. We, Japan is committed to 2050. So I think uh, uh, the internet connection was uh, down, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we might come back to that uh, a bit later. Um, so um, there's another question here, uh, which uh, I, I will direct to, uh, to you, uh, Mark, um, whether there is an interest from the EU uh, to, um, uh, to build an issue-based uh, coalition on climate risk and resilience, low carbon energy with, for example, Japan and other actors, a, a, a sort of issue-based coalition. What, what are the prospects of, of that? Um, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, is this question to me? Uh... So, uh, 
Junichiro, I, I will come back to you in a minute. Uh, we lost yes, the connection with you. We, we lost the connection. So I now moved on to ask uh, Mark a question here, but I will come back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we're actively pursuing the, um, the, the idea of uh, building um, what, we are called, what we are calling now green alliances. Green alliances, not only dealing with climate change, but also topics like biodiversity or the circular economy. We're currently exploring with Japan the possibility of uh, forging such a green alliance. The idea would be that you create a sort of gold standard of cooperation uh, between uh, the EU and a third country, where uh, you would set demanding goals uh, for cooperation amongst yourselves, as well as uh, reaching out to third countries. Uh, so indeed, we are exploring that. Um, we have, um, in the context of our trade agreements, we're trying to clearly bolster the sustainable development chapters uh, to make sure that uh, trade and uh, sustainable development can go more hand in hand than they used to. So yes, we are um, exploring that. Um, as was said uh, a number of times, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is now um, going to depend on what individual countries commit in terms of climate ambition and action. The Paris Agreement is a beautiful shell, but fundamentally it is an empty shell. That shell can only be filled by commitments of individual countries and bilaterally we're trying to persuade others with help uh, to raise their ambition and those sorts of partnerships and alliances are the instruments to get to higher ambitions across the globe thank you um before returning to you, uh, Junichiro, uh, we lost you when you discussed the energy mix here. But um, before returning to you on that, I, I'll just pick up one more question from the audience here. And it, um, it's, it, it's related to China, especially when it comes to cooperation with China on uh, climate related issues. Um, so I, I know that uh, you brought it up uh, earlier in your intervention, uh, Junichiro, so I, I return that question to you, uh, and then you could elaborate a bit more on, uh, uh, on uh, the energy mix uh, that you, where we lost you um, earlier. But the China cooperation and uh, uh, the relation to China within the climate, uh, broader climate conversation. Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. I think China is a very uh, important agenda. And I recognize the commitment that China has shown, um, which is um, 2060 net zero of CO2, as well as um, the peaking out of the, um, their uh, CO2 in 2030. And um, China is uh, um, the second largest economy it's a responsible player. Of course, um, uh, they are categorized as a developing country, but at the same time, um, they have now advanced technologies and uh, they have a great share in uh, renewable energy industry. The um, solar power uh, generators are now uh, provided uh, with um, relatively low cost by the Chinese producers. And um, they have uh, uh, enterprises which focus on wind power uh, technology as well. Um, so I think um, the key um, to come back um, to my earlier question as well, I think one of the um, challenges that we face in moving to a more uh, uh, renewable energy oriented economy is how we can um, introduce such uh, energy with uh, lower costs. Um, Ambassador Van Helken uh, stated that renewable energy now comes at a lower cost. In general terms, I think that applies, but in practice, for each particular country to 
introduce themselves on these particular energy involves a certain uh, societal cost. Um, it is not um, easy. Of course, it involves a certain investment. Um, and also, it needs a transition uh, of the uh, workforce and society in general. Even uh, Europe, European countries, which um, are progressing uh, rapidly in introducing renewable energy, is facing such challenges. If we look at um, uh, several countries in Europe, which are still heavily dependent on fossil fuel, uh, we can uh, witness the difficulty and how um, painful uh, negotiation are uh, taking place in order to carry this out. So sharing experience and learning from um, each country's um, challenges would be very uh, meaningful and useful and uh, finding the way to how to incentivize uh, each actors to take a correct way would be the key to success in my view. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, before we round this up, I, I just want to uh, ask you, Danashri, um, on this, uh, this question that was raised first uh, about um, cooperation with China. Um, and then uh, also uh, India has been initiating and leading the International Solar Alliance. If there are any reflections that you can make on, on you know, the exchange of how to integrate this um, uh, renewable um, other energy sources uh, that uh, Yunichiro just now mentioned. So first China and then and then the other question. Uh, yeah, so as of now, cooperation, say, between India and China is at a very low level, considering the uh, the border clashes and everything. So, uh, and of course, on a lot of other issues also, the cooperation, level of cooperation has come down drastically. So, uh, including on digital issues or even on climate cooperation, which was picking up momentum earlier, uh, more or less nothing much is happening. Uh, especially because now India also wants to uh, reduce its dependence on uh, imported Chinese solar panels, for instance, right? So in that sense, uh, the idea is to reduce dependence as much as possible from a geopolitical perspective on China. So uh, cooperation with China on climate change uh, in this region, of course, a lot of countries will cooperate uh, as it was already the case. Uh, especially because these countries depend on Chinese investments. They are geoeconomically very much in intertwined with the Chinese uh, economy, right? So in that sense, they will depend on it. Uh, but you look at the larger imperative, you look at US-China relations as well, you can see that increased strain, uh, even under the Biden administration, uh, despite the fact that John Kerry has reached out to China a few times and you know, just trying to find if there can be at least issue-specific cooperation, like, okay, keep climate change separate from technology or trade or other issues on which they do not agree anymore. But however, on climate change, because you need uh, international cooperation and you need to keep alive the spirit of multilateralism, let's at least cooperate on that. But you see that it is becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to disassociate these different sectors because like Ganila mentioned, all these issues are intertwined with each other. Now to address climate change, you will also have to address trade and technology and so many other aspects which are very much uh, also linked with uh, your climate, uh, climate change strategy, right? So it is becoming increasingly difficult uh, for at least you can see that the relations between Australia and China are also on a, an all time low. Uh, so in that sense, in the region itself, you can find that uh, that that sense of uh, cooperation has seen a new low, especially since the pandemic and uh, uh, and in the past one year, what we have seen with China's uh, actions in the region, which has not gone down well with the region's uh, countries. However, like I mentioned, uh, there is scope. It's not like there is no scope at all and China has to be part of the solution no matter what because of the reasons that were mentioned earlier as well. It is the largest greenhouse gas emitter. It is one of the largest economies in the world. It has got money and technology. So yes, you know there is, there is a need for cooperating with China uh, 
uh, irrespective of all these concerns that have been raised. Um, and yes, uh, the other aspect is that China has already come up with its own uh, net zero emissions target of 2060, which, and it has also brought in a lot of domestic regulations to ensure that, uh, to ensure that its energy transition happens smoothly. Uh, but like I mentioned in my earlier intervention, I think it's also important for China to uh, to also uh, stop its investments, say in other countries in fossil fuel projects. So this is something that is uh, that is there to watch out for, irrespective of the fact that they talk about green BRI and all of that. So you know whether it is rhetorical or more of symbolic messaging is something that we need to watch out for. Um, as far as energy transition is concerned uh, in, 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 these, in, in the countries of the Indo-Pacific, like I mentioned, uh, for me at least, I don't see coal going away anytime soon. Uh, some of the countries have come up with a strategy saying that, yes, we will uh, try, and, uh, try and not build any more coal plants that is there, which is also a good move. Uh, like a country like India, for instance, has refused to even say that. Uh, in fact, uh, we you know, we continue to uh, we continue to keep coal as one of the mainstays of the energy uh, basket itself, because uh, you know coal, whatever you say, coal uh, production is still cheap, right? So renewable energy may be uh, uh, may be cheaper in terms of production, but then coal is still cheap in in a country like India. So you know, so the and then there are so many states which are dependent on coal production as well. So this, but if you look at if you look at how uh, coal, uh, you know, if you look at even the the sunk cost, for instance, it's, you can see that there is a natural movement away from coal, which is happening. But it is gradual, and it it is going to take time for these countries to make that transition into cleaner uh, cleaner forms of energy. And that, of course, will depend on like like I think it is clearly mentioned even in India's strategy that to achieve India's renewable energy targets of 2030 or 450 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity, it's going to require massive investments from abroad. So uh, you know, so if India, for instance, takes up that strategy and says that we are going to be more ambitious uh, for climate action, I think there is it will depend on how much support will come from outside. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have come to the end, the conclusion of this um, uh, webinar. I thank you all so much for your uh, insightful and really great uh, interventions. Uh, I thank the audience for, for tuning in. And also thank you to Axel, Sophie and Julia who have been uh, operating from behind the scenes. Well done. I, I think this, uh, uh, this, these are the questions that have been brought up today are questions that we will return to um, you know, several times over the coming years. Um, so with that, I, I thank you all and uh, wish you a, a, a good um, Wednesday, I think it is. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.